Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for for being here today, and um, welcome to this the the twenty seventh annual Peterson A. A. Peterson Lectureship and Preaching. My name is Brad Pribino. I am associate dean and also a professor of, of Old Testament um, here. Um, as you came in, if you didn't get, um, we have a little handout that you're that'll give a little information on A. A. Peterson and on this on this. Uh, this series of, of lectures that we do every October. And uh, just as we begin, just want to um, make mention, we're privileged to have uh, A.A. Peterson's daughter with us, Ramona. And I'm going to get your name right, Sedergren, is that correct? And her husband, Vince, are, are here. Um, and uh, we're happy to have them with us. And um, so this has been a, a series that we've, we've done here in, in honor of, in memory of A.A. Peterson for uh, 27 years. And uh, we're really excited not only about our, um, our presenter this morning, but also about the theme kind of in, in um, relation to reflective of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Um, and our topic being um, preaching the book of Job and its reformational themes. We're very happy to have Dr. Reed Lessing with us today. And on the back of that handout, there's also other side of the handout is a, a little background on him. Um, Dr. Reed Lessing um, is a Colorado native, and he serves as senior pastor at St. Michael Lutheran Church, LCMS Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I first met Dr. Lessing in, I think it was 2009, probably about this time of the year, as I made a trip down to Concordia, St. Louis, to um, kind of consider that that's a place for my graduate studies. And he was at that time serving as professor of exegetical theology and a director of the graduate school. And he was at Concordia for 14 years and then um, took the call to uh, Fort Wayne to serve as a pastor there at St. Michael in 2013. Is that correct? At that point. So we actually had Dr. Lessing here for us um, doing um, Isaiah 40 to 55, did a lectureship for us in 2013. Um, I can testify to uh, that Dr. Lessing is a, is a uniquely gifted scholar and theologian and pastor, uh, preacher, and teacher. And he's also a very prolific writer, and we're going to be able to benefit from some of that uh, coming out of this morning. Um, he's provided for us a sermon series on Job um, that you are, that will be, we're making hard copies. We've got some of that available. And if you're interested in getting that in, in electronic format, there's a sign up outside in between the bathrooms that you can sign up for. Uh, put your email address down on that, and we will be happy to to send that out. So very thankful for that resource for us, not only orders of worship, um, sermons, but also uh, many teaching notes that you can use uh, if you'd like to teach. Uh, and it's a Lenten series, series, I should mention that, a Lenten service series. Um, so in addition to a number of his articles, we're also very familiar with a, a, a very in, uh, the commentary, Concordia Commentary Series, which we love around here, uh, Dr. Lessing has contributed a number of volumes, including uh, Amos, a commentary on Amos and on Jonah, which we use in our Hebrew class here, um, as well as Isaiah 40 to 55 and Isaiah 56 to 66. And uh, we, he's co-authored a book that we use as well for our, our Old Testament introduction courses uh, called Prepare the Way of the Lord. Um, on a more personal note, as he, as he says there, he enjoys biking and jogging and camping and cheering for the St. Louis Cardinals, which I don't think will get you in too much trouble around here, but maybe might in some, some situations. Um, and he is married to Lisa, and they have three adult children, Abby, Jonathan, and Lori. Um, we want to preserve as much time as we can this morning. We're going to do three um, hour-long sessions. So this morning, we'll do 15-minute breaks between uh, each of those. And so during the breaks, um, restrooms are over here. We'll have some coffee and refreshments outside. We encourage you to, to take a stretch and, and to honor that time so we can make the most of our time here this morning with, uh, with Dr. Lessing. And, uh, and then we'll, um, I'll mention the J-Term. We've got a little announcement about J-Term and the topic and dates. I'll mention that during one of the, the coming breaks here. So before we invite you up, let me just offer a word of prayer as we begin. Let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you for this opportunity to gather and uh, to consider, again, uh, your servant Job, and to consider, again, your living word to us through this book of Job. We thank you, God, that you are a speaking God, that you spoke the world into existence, that you spoke to the people of Israel, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David, and the prophets. 
and that you spoke ultimately through your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, who gave us the words of eternal life by which we believe and by which we are saved. And, and we thank you that you continue to speak today through the Scriptures, through your Holy Spirit. So thank you for speaking to us. And we are humbled that you would also speak through us, Lord. Um, help us this day as pastors, as ministers, to grow not only in our understanding of your word to us through this book of Job, but also in our understanding of the gospel, in our appreciation, Lord, of what you are saying through Job, and in our ability ultimately to preach it and teach it. It's in Jesus' name and for his sake that we ask it. Amen. Amen. Please welcome Dr. Reed Lesson. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, good morning, good morning. Thanks for coming out on a beautiful morning in uh, Fergus Falls, Minnesota. It's good to be here. It's good to uh, be back here. As uh, Brad said, I was here four years ago uh, talking about uh, the good prophet Isaiah. Uh, so I will uh, ask Brad to uh, function as our timekeeper. And at uh, seven minutes before each break, uh, I'll pause if you can just uh, give me a high sign, and we'll do a little Q&A and, &A and uh, see uh, how that unfolds. So uh, just a couple of um, housekeeping uh, items. Uh, my uh, email address, uh, should you want any of these slides, because for the sermon series, uh, this is the uh, artwork for the sermon series that... Um, you could use like on the front of bulletins. If you want any of this uh, stuff electronically in terms of the PowerPoint presentation, it would be Pastor Lessing, and it's uh, L-E-S-S-I-N-G. Often I say blessing without the B, all right? Uh, at, at, S-T-M, S-T-M, F-W. So St. Michael Fort Wayne, uh, dot O-R-G. So Pastor Lessing at S-T-M, fw.org. Happy to share, um, you know, these resources. Um, I've got a lot of stuff. So if, if you're, you know, uh, stuck on something or you're looking at First Peter or you're doing a sermon series uh, uh, through Leviticus, um, if you're looking at First John, if you're looking at uh, some stuff in Paul, um, you know, just shoot me an email. I'm happy to uh, share stuff with you. Matthew 10, verse 8, freely you've received, freely give. So uh, I love to resource pastors. I'm a pastor myself. I'm looking for resources quite often. Um, so here we are on Job. Job, let me um, um, just uh, share with you what you will either get hard copy or electronically. It's a booklet with a uh, 85 pages, I kind of have it here, and um, as Brad said, um, you will uh, have um, eight sermons um, along with the uh, sermon outlines, so full orders of worship, as well as uh, six uh, adult Bible classes on Job. Um, so then you can kind of take uh, what you're learning this morning uh, and uh, package it and deliver it uh, to those that you serve. So, um, Martin Luther, obviously, uh, has a lot to say about Job, and we're going to look at Luther, uh, Job through Luther's lenses, Luther's theological categories, uh, this morning. Uh, he asserted, quote, that Job is magnificent and sublime as no book of Scripture. Uh, others have called Job the Shakespeare of the Bible. Uh, yet an early Christian scholar named Jerome perhaps put it best when he called the book of Job an eel, an eel, E-E-L. So have you ever tried to grab onto an eel? <laughs> they're slippery when wet, <laughs> and they're always wet, so they're always slippery. So we've all experienced Job to some extent, right? And, and Job is um, difficult to get our hands on. Um, just when we think we know Job, uh, Job kind of slips away like a slippery, wet eel. Uh, so the purpose of our time this morning is to essentially be able to grab on to Job <laughs> and understand Job and hold on to Job and do more than that, treasure Job and uh, delight in Job 
and see how Job uh, informs our lives and then the lives that we are privileged uh, to serve. All right, so uh, we're calling uh, the sermon series, obviously, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord, uh, picking up on Job 121. Uh, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, and <laughs> we know this. Uh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, so here's Job, 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 just to kind of get our, our minds off of the Green Bay Packers and uh, the Minnesota Vikings and, uh, and the people taking a knee and North Korea and all of our personal issues and problems and just pause and, and understand where we're going to be this morning. Uh, we're going to be sitting on an ash heap with Job. Uh, and there are his three friends, uh, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz. Uh, Elihu is in the background. Elihu's going to be one of the heroes of the book. Uh, and, of course, there's Job's wife, the famous curse God and die, Job's wife. All right? Um, so this is where we're going to go to an ancient land of Uz, not Oz, Uz, <laughs> and... Uh, see what God teaches us through this magnificent 42-chapter book of Job. Well, here would be the um, uh, outline of our time this morning, uh, some introductory comments. Uh, then again, using uh, Luther and, and uh, Luther's categories uh, that we uh, treasure and love <laughs> and uh, uh, delight in, especially uh, this month, right? Uh, so, Scripture interprets Scripture. We understand that. Sola Scriptura. Uh, how does that uh, help us understand Job? Uh, certainly by faith and not by works. Uh, the centrality of Jesus, the theology of the cross, and then the Lutheran pastor. All right? Um, so, so, the idea is not to go through the sermons on Job, right? You can do that on your own. Um, but uh, introduce or perhaps reintroduce you uh, to this marvelous book uh, around uh, these uh, uh, cherished Lutheran categories. So let's go to the introduction here. Um, and we would turn to, uh, if you have your Bibles out, uh, we would turn to James. Uh, James chapter 5, uh, verse 11, which is uh, perhaps you might think that's a strange place to begin. Why don't we begin with Job 1, verse 1? <laughs> uh, but we're going to begin with uh, James 5.11. Uh, of course, many of you know this, that the only time Job appears in the New Testament is right here, all right, in uh, James 5.11. Uh, so this gives us a, uh, a New Testament perspective on Job um, and his book, all right? So what we want to understand in terms of the way the book of James works is uh, James 1, James chapter 1, gives us uh, really the, the whole uh, book, all right? So if you just read James 1, you understand the major themes of uh, this five-chapter epistle. Uh, so when you get to chapter 5, um, he's going to be reiterating what he has taught in chapter 1, which is what he's doing in chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5, right? Uh, in, in the last four chapters, he's reiterating what he states in chapter 1. Uh, so it's in fine Hebraic form, repetition with intensity, all right? So he's going to repeat himself, um, and then he's going to get more intense, more specific as he goes on. This doesn't surprise us. Uh, James, half-brother of Jesus, uh, is a Hebraic in his thinking and in his way of communicating. That, that's an important piece to understand uh, because uh, we're, we're all familiar uh, with these uh, marvelous uh, introductory words in James. Uh, for example, uh, in James... Um, uh, you know, one verse two, count it all joy, brothers, when you uh, fall into various trials of many kinds, knowing that uh, the uh, trying of your faith creates, and here's a, a key word for James, keep a moaning, 
So I just read from James 1 verse 3. We could see the, the same word used in James 1 verse 4 and James 1 verse 12. So what he's done is he says, this whole epistle is about hypomone. Now what's hypomone? Um, it's translated here as persevere. It's a compound of two Greek words, hypo, under, mone, remain, right? Um, so it's all about remaining under. Remaining under what? <laughs> remaining under God's purging fire. Very important to understand the book of Job. So hypomone, uh, staying under God's refining fire. And that produces, big Greek word here in James 1 verse 3, that produces dokamon. Dokamon, which is often translated character, character. Um, and it, it means a tried Christian character, a, 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 a humble Christian character, a mature Christian character, a maturing Christian character. Uh, for Paul, th this is his main goal, <laughs> is to be dokamon, right? In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, as a pastor, we understand this, uh, less preaching to others, I myself may become a docomone, right? Uh, unqualified is how that is often uh, translated in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But it means I don't have a character, all right? It means I don't have any depth. I don't have any Jesus. I don't have any Holy Spirit. And, and I can preach to others all about that. And I do, and so do you probably. But, but if I don't have Christian character, it, it's all just kind of empty, finally. So God's goal for the believer, at least using this metaphor, is to hypomone, remain under, remain under the fire, right? So I can be purged of all of my character deficiencies. And my wife says they are many. <laughs> Got it? So, so when we go to a key text in Job, chapter 23, verse 10, it, it, he, Job's going to use the same metaphor. Uh, the, the Hebrew word there is going to be bakan which means to test or try. When he has tested or tried me, I will come forth as gold. That's a pivotal verse in Job. It's an organizing verse. It helps us understand what's going on. 23.10. It, so it's the same metaphor here. Job understands that he is to remain under, remain under the purging fire of, of, of Yahweh. All right? So, here we go, <laughs> James 5, 11. Uh, we consider blessed those who have hypomoned because that's what James finally is all about. You've heard of Job's hypomone and have seen what the Lord finally brought about, the telos, the telos, that's the Greek word there in James 5, 11. The end, the end. You have to begin with the end in mind, <laughs> right? What's the end? The end is vindication in chapter 42 of Job, and, and the final end uh, would be in chapter 19, verse 26, after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I and not another how my heart yearns within me. That's the telos. So, so Job has the telos, the end of uh, the, the fire, right? Uh, the purging fire in chapter 42, but, but he thinks eschatologically, right, at the final tell us, the final end, where in my flesh I will see God. Uh, so so if, <laughs> when we're going through suffering, we got to keep in mind the telos, right, the end. Uh, and what is the end? Uh, well, in Job, the rest of Job's life is going to be the best of Job's life because God restores him twofold right? Um, so, so God's refining fire is, is not a permanent uh, fixture in our lives, right? It's a season. It's a season. 
Uh, and that's what the book of Job teaches us. So we keep in mind the telos, the end, and we keep in mind the final telos, right? Because I know that my Redeemer lives, and on the last day he will stand upon the earth. Um, if we lose sight of the telos, the end, uh, we're doomed, right? We're doomed. Well, then the suffering, then the fire will just um, completely overwhelm us. And then we have this uh, piece. The Lord is full of compassion. Here, uh, James is Greek, poly, full, and splachnos, right? This uh, great uh, uh, Greek idea, splachnos, spleen, gut. Daniel, right? I had you, or no, I never had you a student, but I, I remember you from St. Louis. Daniel has 24 children. Uh, is the last I, I uh, figured out, right, right, right. He had 18 while he was in St. Louis, right? That's right, yep, yep, yep. Um, well, okay, so um, Daniel knows, Daniel's your Greek guy here, right? Daniel knows all about splonknos, right? It's a fairly common verb uh, in, the, in the New Testament, splonknizomai. Here we don't have the verb, we have the noun, splonknos, spleen, got the King James Version, often bowels, but that didn't get you very far these days, all right? Um, but God has a heart. He's full of splonknos, right? Um, he he uh, abounds in, in um, uh, feelings toward Job, right? Um, because it's easy to read the book of Job and think a lot of the, the character of God, the way God's portrayed in Job is, is that he's, he's a, a, a tax accountant for the internal revenue service, right? That God is uh, distant and aloof and, and doesn't care and never shows up. And um, that's how it sometimes appears in our lives too, right? Um, but he is full of compassion and mercy. So any discussion on the book of Job uh, begins... Uh, in the New Testament, in James uh, 5, verse 11, to, to help us understand the big picture, uh, what God is trying to do in the lives of his people, including us. Hippomone, stay under the fire. See, when you're under the fire, uh, as simul justus epicata, right, we still have this simul, this simultaneously sinner and saint, the sinner wants to get out of the fire, right? The sinner says, don't stay in the fire. Uh, the sinner says, it's a waste to stay in the fire. The sinner says, do something dumb, dirty, and cheap, and do it now. But God would invite us to stay under the fire, right? Stay under the fire. Uh, we understand from Psalm uh, 30, verse 5, um, that his anger lasts for a moment, his favor a lifetime. So, so the fire lasts for a moment, so stay in it. <laughs> stay in it. Pray through it. Read your Bible through it. Meditate on Scripture through it. Um, so that's the goal, is to keep a moaning. Hang in there. Don't quit. Don't quit. Job had a lot of problems, uh, and he's, he's far from perfect in the book, but he didn't quit. He didn't quit. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, that would be the... The major piece from the New Testament, obviously, this is the only place where we have Job mentioned in the New Testament. Again, just by way of introduction, uh, Job himself, okay, the, the, the word Job uh, means enemy, enemy. Uh, and so what do we mean by that? Um, in Job chapter 27 verse 7, he says, God is my enemy. All right? Um, and uh, in Job chapter 13, verse 24, which you'll have all this, you know, in your um, booklets, um, but in Job 13, 24, uh, Job feels like God is treating him as the enemy, the enemy. So it's important to understand, quite often you know this, especially in the Old Testament, what the people's names mean. Uh, and Job derives from the Hebrew word for enemy. 
So he feels like he is God's enemy, uh, and, and uh, he looks as God as his enemy. So this tells us that we uh, uh, need reconciliation <laughs> because um, uh, both parties in the book uh, are called the enemy. Um, the drama in the book of Job takes place on two levels. Again, very, very important. On the earthly level, we've got Job and Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, right? The three quote-unquote friends. And on the parallel level, all right, um, the heavenly level, um, we've got Yahweh and the Satan, all right? Um, so it's an earthly level and heavenly level. Um, we've got Job, Bildad, Eliphaz, Zophar, Elihu, Job's wife. See, they're all on the human level, on the earthly level. And, and the only people in the uh, heavenly level uh, would be Yahweh and Ha Satan, right? The accuser, or more freely, the prosecuting attorney. And, and the people on the earthly level never know what's going on the heavenly level, right? See? All right? So it's very important uh, to, to when we come to the issue of suffering, of being in the refining fire, is quite often we don't know why. Because we're on a different level. To, in fact, to try and answer the question why, is the wrong question to ask in the book of Job. Also, okay, so here it is. The heavenly level is conflict between Yahweh and Satan, all right? So, so many of us know uh, Satan, he actually comes with a definite article, ha, Satan. So that's why I might uh, uh, translate this, the prosecuting attorney, uh, so, so obviously we don't have time to go into great depth on demonology in the Bible. But this ha-satan uh, in the Old Testament appears uh, one more time, all right? In of all places, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 2, where the post-exilic prophet has this vision, one of eight night visions, and uh, he sees ha-satan, the prosecuting attorney, uh, accusing uh, a man called Joshua, who was the post-exilic high priest in Persian Yehud, all right? So, so Hasatan only appears twice in the Old Testament. Satan, without the definite article, all right, appears once in 1 Chronicles 21, David's sinful census, all right? So by the time you get to Chronicles, which is one of the, the last, you know, books in the Old Testament, uh, he actually has uh, a name. See, see in, in Job and Zechariah, it's the, the Satan. Uh, so technically, um, he he's, he's, doesn't have a name, all right? He has a title. But First Chronicles 21, he's, he, he loses the definite article. He's just Satan. And so then that paves the way, obviously, for a much more expanded and robust Satanology in the New Testament, all right? Suffice it to say that this, this Satan, all right, uh, and the Satan we know <laughs> uh, from the New Testament are one and the same, all right? But there is somewhat of a development uh, along the way. All right, so these earthly and heavenly conflicts center around one question. This is... The question of the book, um, the question of the book is not, why do I suffer? See, I've read Job with, with trying to find the answer to that question. Maybe you have too. And how far did that gets you? It didn't get you anywhere, right? Why do I suffer? Uh, there's no book in the Bible that answers that question. Not specifically, all right? Um, so the question of the book of Job is this. All right. Do people serve God because of rewards or out of a loving gratitude? That's it. All right. And the question is going to come again in chapter 2, verse 3. Um, 
So if you, you look at your Bibles here in uh, Job 1 verse 9, Thus Satan, the prosecuting attorney, answered Yahweh, and he said, and, and here it is, ha Kenam. all right? Uh, and is it Kenam? Kenam. that's the adverb in Hebrew. Um, is it graciously? Is it freely? All right. Is it sola fide, <laughs> sola gratia, uh, that Job uh, worships Yahweh, fears Yahweh, right, is actually the, the, the Hebrew there, um, or not? So, so the question then is um, not uh, why do the righteous suffer, but why do the righteous serve Yahweh? That's the question of the book. Why do the righteous serve Yahweh? Especially when Yahweh doesn't show up, right? From, from chapters 3 through 37. Why would you serve someone who doesn't even show up? Who doesn't even communicate? Why would you serve someone who allows this purging fire to come on full throttle and take everything away? Why would you serve that God? So that's the question of the book. Why do the righteous, the believers, serve God? Why do they live a pious life? Is it for rewards or just simply kenam, graciously, freely, without expecting anything back? This is the question of the believer's life, right? Um, why are we doing what we do? Um, are we doing it for rewards? Well, let's be honest. <laughs> There's uh, this simul part, right? This uh, pakatar part that is exactly doing it for rewards, right? Um, I do this so I can feel better about myself and I can uh, uh, see a growing church and I can have the, the uh, a great uh, satisfaction of, of learning and growing as a theologian. Um, and yet what happens when the church doesn't grow, uh, when I, I don't feel like I'm growing, uh, when I'm stagnant uh, spiritually and, and theologically, uh, and I don't feel like I'm getting anything out of this. I'm getting nothing out of this. All right? Um, that's the question. See, it, it, it's how Paul kind of frames it in Philippians 1.21. For me to live is Christ to die as gain. See, it's not for me to live is to have all these good things happen. <laughs> it's not for me to live to be a successful pastor, professor, or, or whatever. For me to live is Jesus. And so to put it in New Testament terms, that's the book of Job. Is Yahweh enough? Is Yahweh enough? Or do you, do you think you need more? <laughs> and then we're to places like Psalm 73 where sweet Asaph, right, says, Whom have I in heaven? but you. And on earth, there's nothing I desire beside you. See, I just want Yahweh. This is Habakkuk chapter 3, right? The, 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 uh, the pomegranates don't give their fruit, and there's no sheep in the vine, and there's no figs on the fig tree, and, and I want to go home and eat rocks, and it's a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I'm paraphrasing here. Um, Yet will I rejoice in Yahweh. See, so, so the, the believer has the great but. However, nevertheless, Paul Harvey, page two. I'm not giving up. See, so that's the book of Job. All right, and Satan, the Satan, says, well, Job's just in it for what he can get out of it. Take away all the gifts, he'll curse the giver. You with me on this? Because sooner or later... Sooner or later, what will we have? All we will have is Yahweh on our dying bed. That's it. And so that's the challenge of the book. So, so the, the accuser says, take away all of these rewards, and, and Job will curse you. And God says, you're wrong. Let's bet. Let's bet. Okay, by its opening scene in heaven and subsequent conversations, the book shows how we only see a fragment of what's really going on, all right? Job doesn't know about the bet, the wager. He never knows. You never know what's going on completely. Neither do I, right? But boy, these three friends come along and say, say we know exactly what's going on, right? 
Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar. Okay, so that's just to kind of get our, our Jobin juices flowing, all right? Uh, so now we want to, oh no, we, we do want to look at a modest outline of the book in terms of introduction. It's pretty simple, right? Um, prose, by prose I simply mean narrative, all right? Narrative. Um, so the first two chapters, pretty easy reading. The last section of chapter 42, pretty easy reading. Uh, it's the poetry uh, that would be challenging, right? So essentially, this is obviously kind of a simplistic outline, but it, it re-reminds us of the book itself. The crisis, really, which is uh, much of the book, and then divine wisdom is celebrated in chapter 28. More questions. And then, as I said, Elihu speaks. Elihu, when we get to the Lutheran pastor, is the model Lutheran pastor. All right, uh, Elihu speaks. And then Yahweh speaks, right, in the storm. Um, and then we have the conclusion. Okay, um, so there's our introduction. Uh, so now, having uh, done all of that with the James 5 and the two levels and, and Job 1 9, that's the key to the book. Uh, why do people serve God? Uh, we now enter into some of these uh, great Lutheran categories. Uh, to better uh, appreciate, understand, apply uh, the book of Job. So scripture interprets scripture. Um, the book of Job does not indicate who wrote it, right? I think we're all familiar with this. Um, in other words, it doesn't say like the book of Isaiah, right? Uh, Kazon Yeshayahu, um, the vision of Isaiah. So we know Isaiah wrote Isaiah. That's what Isaiah 1 verse 1 says. We don't have anything like that in Job. So we don't know who wrote it. Um, the book of Job, okay, here we go. The book's era. Now this is very, 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 very important, all right? The book's era must be sometime early in Israel's time in Egypt. So how do we get there? Well, I, I don't want to bore you with a bunch of names and uh, scripture references, so I'll bore you with a bunch of names and scripture references. No, I won't do that. But, but uh, this is on page 69 of, you know, the booklet that you'll get. Um, but, but we do need to know that Eliphaz was one of Esau's grandsons. Now, I know that probably doesn't float your boat too much, but that floats mine a whole lot, all right? So Eliphaz, build that Eliphaz so far. One of the three friends was a grandson of Esau. Who's Esau? Jacob's older brother, right? Um, Jacob and Esau. Uh, Bildad, Bildad, okay, another friend. And, and, you know, you've got, this is Genesis 36, 10 and 11, if you really want to know, um, with uh, uh, Eliphaz. But Bildad is a descendant of Shua, Job 2, 11, who is Abraham's son by his wife Keturah. So see, what are we doing? These genealogies. Like in 1 Chronicles, of course, 1 Chronicles begins with nine chapters of genealogies. The genealogies in Genesis 25 and 36 locate two of these friends right after Jacob and Esau, all right? Uh, that would be Eliphaz. Uh, Bildad um, is a direct descendant of Abraham, all right? Elihu, remember this uh, guy that comes in at the end of the book in, in uh, chapter um, 32. Um, Elihu is a descendant of Buzz. Uh, I'm sorry, Eli, yeah, and the son of Abraham's brother Nahor. All right. Um, so all of these people uh, that we meet in the book of Job are. Uh, about three generations removed from Esau and Jacob. That's kind of the, the main point I'm making here. So um, 
the, the main characters in the book are three generations removed from Esau and Jacob, which means the events happened early in Israel's sojourn in Egypt, right? So about, these are just some uh, guesstimates, uh, 1876 BC to 1700 BC. Now, now the events didn't happen in Egypt, right? Uh, they ha happened in the land of Oz, which uh, Lamentations teaches us uh, is in the land of Edom, all right, which would be obviously south and east of Israel. So why is this important? This is important because the book of Job is the earliest, I'm going to just put this out here for you, is the earliest and the first book of the Bible. This predates who? Moses. Moses. All right? So the, the great theology that we see in the book of Job comes from um, the oral accounts that we have roughly from, uh, you know, Genesis, uh, you know, 1 to, to 50, okay? Um, the whole book of Genesis. So the book of Job has Genesis theology. How did they get, how did they know all this stuff? Oh, well, they're, they're related to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Esau. This is why these people know about creation when we look at the creational accounts in the book of Job and in the Yahweh speeches, right, in chapters 39, 30, uh, 39 and 40. This is why they know about justification by grace through faith, right, because they have that from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Avram believed Yahweh, and Yahweh kashaved it, reckoned it, counted it as righteousness. This is why they know of a gracious, loving God, right? Because they had the oral traditions of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when you talk about Scripture, interpret Scripture, and here's the big point. The whole Bible begins with what book? Job. Usually we think Genesis, right? But not so. So, um, just the, the chronology forces us to understand that um, uh, this is who these people are. Now, now let's just pause here and, and let me put it this way. Is it surprising to you that, that the foundation of the biblical record is recorded by outsiders? These are not insiders. These are not descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob in terms of the people who went down to Egypt. These are the people who stayed in Edom. These are the outsiders. Does that surprise you? It shouldn't. Because one of the main messages of, of the Bible is that the insiders often don't get it, and the outsiders do. All right? All right, uh, Jesus, this is Jesus' ministry, right? The insiders, the brightest and best of his day, killed him. It was the outsiders that welcomed him, right? Uh, think about the book of Jonah, right? It's the sailors in chapter 1, the Ninevites in chapter 3 that get it. Jonah's the insider. He's oblivious to the, the ways of God. Um, so God uses these outsiders right? Uh, the, the Jobs and the Elihus, right? Even Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz um, to set the stage for the biblical narrative. All right, so we conclude that Job appears to be a wealthy Edomite, and, and the land of Uz, as I said, Lamentations 4.21 tells us that's the land of Edom. Uh, so, so Job is probably, right, uh, related to his ancestor Esau, right, uh, at least two generations afterwards. So this is where Job got all this stuff from Esau. We think Esau was a hairy red guy that blew it, right? Well, not completely. Esau was told the narrative of creation, 
and, and Noah and the Tower of Babel. Uh, Esau was told about Abraham and Isaac, right? Um, so that's who Job is. If the 140 years of Job uh, 42 um, is twice his age before his affliction, this would mean he died about at 210. Abraham lived to be 175, Isaac to 180. So, so this fits, right, um, in this patriarchal period. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to argue for in a nice, kind, humble Lutheran way, all right? Another way to just kind of understand the, the antiquity of the book, that's what we're trying to, to point out, the antiquity of the book. Uh, Job received money from his friends in the form of a kasita, just transliterated Hebrew, uh, Job 42.11, a measure of silver that's mentioned elsewhere, only in the connection with who? This should not surprise us. Jacob. Jacob. See, liberal scholars want to put Job where? At the end of the biblical revelation, right? All right. Well, you know, they don't want to take these verses as, you know, actual historical fact. But when you start looking at the verses, you have to say, oh, Job is not the end. Job's at the front end. So if the events in Job happened during Israel's sojourn in Egypt, when was the book written? See, that, that's another question. Um, when was the book written? written. Um, and it's probably safe to say, um, and before we go on to that, um, that the poetry in chapters, remember, three through even into a little bit of chapter 42, is archaic. If you know Hebrew, as uh, Dr. Pribino said, you don't start with the poetry in Job. You start with Jonah. Because <laughs> Joan is easy. The poetry of Job uh, is very difficult. In fact, there are over 100 one time words. Of course, you know the Greek for that, hapox legomenon, right? Hapox one legomenon spoken. So, 100 one time words. Uh, so, they don't appear in any other Old Testament book except Job. There are many rare words. There's old case endings. There's an Aramaic flavor uh, to Job. Uh, there's a Ugaritic flavor to Job in just its language. So the, the language itself tells us that it was written very early, all right, with its Aramaisms and Ugaritisms and its uh, 100 one-time words. It makes sense that this, this, this is a dialect in large part that was Edomite, right? An Edomite dialect of Hebrew rather than uh, kind of the standard Solomonic, Davidic uh, Hebrew that most of us know and love. So when uh, did the events happen? Um, they happened in the sojourn in Egypt. When was it written? Very close to that time. So you could say it was probably written by Job. We don't know for sure, right, as I began this section. Um, but uh, we do know it's, it's um, uh, very ancient, very ancient. The only other Old Testament references to Job uh, outside his book are in, are in Ezekiel. Uh, 1414 and 1420, where uh, Job is mentioned with Noah, Noah, and a certain Daniel, Daniel. And that Daniel of Ezekiel 1414 and 1420 is probably not the Daniel of the Old Testament. It's probably a Ugaritic figure. Because the idea here in Ezekiel 14 is he is invoking the, the ancient fathers, see, uh, Noah, Job, and then this uh, uh, paradigmatic, righteous, Ugaritic figure named Daniel. And of course, the only time in the New Testament is James 4 or 5, 11, and we're experts on that. All right, so 
this, this should not surprise us, this next slide. The book of Job is a microcosm of the biblical narrative. Everything in Job is simply going to be repeated and explained and expounded upon and furthered. So the, the Bible begins in an idyllic way. So does the book of Job, right? Genesis 1 and 2, Job 1. They both testified to diabolical intrusion, right? The, the nakash, the nakash, the serpent in Genesis 3, verse 1. We're going to come back to that. <laughs> we will come back to that. Um, so don't forget that. But, but at any rate, uh, both begin with, uh, uh, you know, idyllic, utopian um, ways of life, uh, diabolical intrusion. Uh, a fall of unfathomable proportions, right? This is, this is Adam and Eve. This is Job. Announce, they both announce God's intervention. Finally, the word became flesh, right? John 1, 14. And a picture, uh, they both picture an ending that is much like the beginning, only greater. Remember, the, uh, Job was restored what? Twofold. So the Bible ends, right, uh, not with, uh, just since this is uh, a seminary, I'll use these terms, urzeit like enzeit, all right? Uh, the urzeit, the early time, like equals the enzeit. Not so. The enzeit, the, the end time, the Revelation 21 and 22, that's not equal to Genesis 1 and 2. It's better. It's better. Well, and that's how the book of Job ends. He doesn't get everything back. He gets everything back what? Double. Double. So once you have the book of Job, you've got the Bible. You've got the Bible. So when we're talking about Scripture interpreting Scripture, in any number of cases... From, from Job on, the next 65 books are going to dive deeply into Job and his theology, his framework, etc. Good. So uh, uh, thank you so much, Brad. We are seven minutes. We want to do seven, not six. All right. Uh, <laughs> seven minutes before our first break and uh, see if there are any um, questions out here. Yes, sir. We will give, since we're talking about twofold restoration, we will give you two questions. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes. For everyone. Is this on? There you go. Uh, the, okay. The first, uh, the first question I have is regarding that passage uh, of disqualification. Uh, he says, uh, talking about running the race, but, or I mean, uh, excuse me, not running the race, but. Uh, no, you, that, that's part of it. I think. Uh, right, at uh, the end of First Corinthians 9. And mm -hmm. then talking about, uh, uh, at the end, being himself disqualified. I always uh, was troubled by that verse. What, you know, what does it exactly mean? Is it related to those verses in Hebrews where it talks about. The, uh, it seems to be talking about that you can lose your, your so, you know, salvation and I'll pause. I can't remember the two verses in Hebrews, but there was a couple troubling verses in Hebrews. It seems like it could or may, may or may not relate to that. Right. No, that's a very good question. So um, it, it would be in Hebrews 6 about verses 4 through 6 generally. Okay. I know it's in Hebrews 6. So, so with, without going into the, the interpretation of Hebrews 6, um, I believe what Paul is saying um, is that um, if we look at Romans chapter 5, right, being in verse 3, he, he says, and we rejoice in our afflictions because suffering produces hope and hope produces, here's our word, character. See, character, dokamon, 
So I think at the end of, of 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, when he says, ah, docomone, right, alpha privative, you know, like ah, moral or ah, religious, ah, docomone, it, it negates the noun. Um, he's simply saying, um, and not in terms of salvation, see, but in terms of having uh, authenticity. You understand as a public speaker, there are three points to being a good public speaker. You have to have logos. Logos, this is, right, Aristotle and rhetoric. You have to have words, <laughs> right? Logos, right? You have to have pathos, right? You, you, I mean, it has to be authentic. You really actually enjoy what you're talking about, right? But you also have to have ethos, ethic, right? I can't get up here and talk about this stuff. And, and go off and, you know, sow my wild oats or whatever, uh, for, live beyond the fire of God's purging. Well, I have to have a certain ethic, a certain authenticity. So Paul is saying, I, I, I can have the logos and I can have the pathos. I want to make sure I have the ethos too, all right? I have the ethic of what I'm saying, okay? the character, the character. So when I get up there and, and, and preach as a pastor and, and, and where I serve after four years, most of the people know what kind of person I am, all right? It, it, you get it, right? Most of your pastors. People understand, you know, are you prompt? Do you say what you're going to say? Uh, do, do, do you uh, cut people down in private? Uh, are, are you uh, publicly optimistic but privately cynical? People figure that out. See, so I, as a pastor, if I'm going to preach, I've got to be a growing, active, vibrant believer. That's what that's what Paul's after. Yes, right. Not a not apostatizing, as in All Hebrews came. chapter six. All came. Yes, yes, yes. And the, but yes. And then the second question I have is uh, unrelated to Joel, but but it's um, something that. I've uh, wondered for a very long time is that we understand, I believe if uh, um, uh, that the, the gospel is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that by believing in him, we uh, receive that, that righteousness or our sins are forgiven. And that's the gospel. But well, my question is, is that in, in the gospels, um, it talks about Jesus preaching the gospel but in those same gospels there's a passage in there where he says uh we understand that he's the son of god he specifically tells his disciples you know uh, uh don't tell them that i'm the the son of god and so what gospel was he preaching what uh what what good news was he preaching if if they couldn't tell that he was the son of God when he was preaching the good news. I, I never understood that. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, that's why we have uh, Daniel here. He's our New Testament expert, right? Right, right. And, and just in a nutshell, in a, this is very simplistic, but see, I want to honor our time, that um, throughout Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all right, uh, within that Jewish milieu, the term... Mashiach, right, with Messiah, which is synonymous with the Greek word Christos or Christ, anointed one, the Davidic deliverer, meant one thing, see, to the, the Jews, all right, a Mashiach meant a, uh, a political leader who is going to overturn Rome, and this is what the disciples understood by and large, because uh, this is what they ask in Acts 1, verse 6, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And then Acts 1, 7, you don't know the times or seasons the Father's appointed. And then, of course, Acts 1, 8, right? You'll receive power, etc. cetera. So, so most of the people believe that Jesus was going to be a political um, person, and, and that was tagged to the word Mashiach. So he says, don't tell them that I'm the Mashiach because they'll think I'm going to be a political deliverer. Jesus' favorite title for himself was what? Son of man. And that's not Ezekiel's son of man. 
Um, that's the Danielian son of man of Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, who, who is equal to the Ancient of Days, who receives glory, power, honor, and wisdom in all nations, peoples, languages, serve him. So Jesus, it's often called the messianic secret. See, uh, Jesus is a different kind of Messiah. So Jesus doesn't walk around saying, I'm the Messiah. He says, I'm the son of man. 